So where does life come from? What is it? Why are we here? What are we for? What is the meaning of life? There's a conventional wisdom which says that science has nothing to say about such questions. Well, all I can say is that if science has nothing to say, it's certain that no other discipline can say anything at all. But in fact, of course, science has a great deal to say about such questions. If we ever meet life from another planet, the creatures from there will not be our cousins. They will have evolved entirely independently. They won't have DNA, would be my guess. However, I would be prepared to say that they are likely to have quite a lot in common with us simply because there's a lot of similar problems to be solved in living. And those problems are likely to be the same all over the universe. So although they won't have DNA, they'll have something very similar in function. It'll do something very like DNA, and it'll work in a similar way to DNA. I'd also be prepared to put my shirt on the bet that they will have evolved by the equivalent of Darwinian natural selection. If we're ever visited by life forms from another planet, they will certainly have evolved the power to think and do science. Otherwise, they couldn't have got here. And their science is bound to be essentially the same as our science. This is because the principles of physics and chemistry are the same all over the universe. They'll have the same values of the constants of constant pi as we have. They'll have Pythagoras' theorem. They'll have relativity, although they won't attribute it to Einstein. They'll probably find us pretty childish, but they'll be quite kind about our science. They'll pat us on the head and say, well, what you know about the universe is pretty much correct. You've got a lot to learn yet, but you're doing fine. Keep it up. That's what they'd say if they were talking to our scientists. What if they were talking to our best lawyers or literary critics or theologians? I doubt if they'd be so impressed. They might be, their anthropologists, the equivalent of their anthropologists, might be, of, might be interested in us. But they would be bound to notice that our cultural beliefs are very local and parochial. Not just by their standards, their universal standards, where they certainly would be, but even by our own standards. Because what people believe on our planet depends so much on whereabouts on the planet they happen to be born, which is a fairly odd thing. The Adam and Eve myth is believed by a lot of people in certain parts of the world. But if you go to other parts of the world, you'll find them believing very different myths. This is a Hindu myth, which is also very beautiful. And we have, there are other Hindu myths as well. This is another Hindu mi myth of churning the milk of the ocean with a churn, gods and demons churning an axle with a turtle on the bottom, and out of the ocean came, as butter comes out of milk, came all living creatures. These creation myths are very beautiful, but they're all different from one another, and they can't all be true. And it's very odd if people believe simply what the other people in their own country happen to believe just because they're in that, that country. Look how scientists handle their disagreements now. Take a particular disagreement. Why did the dinosaurs go extinct? There are various theories. This is the theory that a comet or meteorite hit the Earth and caused a catastrophe that drove the dinosaurs extinct, and a lot of scientists believe that. A lot of scientists, on the other hand, believe that a virus killed the dinosaurs. And another lot of scientists believe that the mammals arose and ate the dinosaurs' eggs. Now, I've no doubt there's something going for all those theories. The point is that different scientists believe them. And the reason why they disagree is that there isn't enough evidence yet. Everybody knows, everybody agrees about what sort of evidence would be needed in order to make them change their mind. But suppose science worked like creation myths, or like languages. Here we have a map of world languages. In this red area, English is spoken. There, Spanish is spoken. There, Russian is spoken. And it's quite natural that pe you should be able to, to plot a map like that, that people should speak the language of their country. But what if scientific theories were like that? What if we had a similar map of the distribution of scientific theories? Suppose in the red area everyone believed the meteor theory of the dinosaur extinction. And in that area everybody believed the virus theory. And in that area everybody believed the mammals eating the eggs theory. Wouldn't that be a pretty silly sort of science? Imagine the scene, two scientists arguing, and one of them says, I believe that the dinosaurs went extinct because a comet hit the Earth. Why do I believe that? 
because that's what my father and grandfather believed and that's what people in my country have always believed but I believe that it was a virus that drove the dinosaurs extinct why do I believe that because my father and grandfather believed it and that's what people in my country have always believed or suppose the conversation went like this never mind the evidence I just know that a comet struck the earth because it's been privately revealed to me that a comet struck the earth but I just know that it was a virus because I just know it because I just know it because I have faith that it was a virus if you overheard conversations like that you'd think they were pretty odd scientists wouldn't you you'd see no reason to believe any of them There's nothing wrong with having faith in a proper scientific prediction this is a heavy cannonball I'm going to stand here and I'm going to release it and it's going to come it's going to go over there and it's going to come roaring back towards me and all my instincts are going to tell me to run for it <laughs> but I have enough faith in the scientific method to know that it's going to stop just about an inch short or perhaps less of my head <laughs> so here goes I felt the wind of it. Look at these leaves here. Autumn leaves. Look at the vein up the middle of the leaves. Look at the veins on either side. Look at the little splodges of dark colored mold on the leaves. But those are not leaves. Those are butterflies. Look there, you can just see the body there, 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 there. That's what these butterflies look like when they open their wings. This is what they look like on the underside of the wings. And they normally sit with the wings folded so that you only see the underside of the wings. And you're very hard put to it to see that they're not dead leaves. Only when they open the wings do you get this flash of brilliant coloration. Camouflaged animals resemble inedible objects. Designoid objects sometimes resemble other designoid objects for other reasons because they're doing the same job. And this is called convergent, like a spider web. Now, if we could have the lights down, I think we might be able to see. Now, there is a spider in the middle of its web, and that, I think, shows quite nicely. Good. Right, well, you know what a spider web is for. It's for catching flies and other prey. It's a net and the, it works in two dimensions. It's, we would have liked to have actually shown you a, a spider building its web, but this one seems to be uh, pretty satisfied with the web it's already got. So um, what I'm going to do instead is to show you a computer reconstruction of a spider's movements while it builds a web. Now, I have to watch carefully. This is rather speeded up. Can we have that more slowly now, Peter? What the spider is now doing is the radii of the web. Now it's doing the structural spiral, which is a kind of, of uh, scaffolding. And now it's doing the sticky spiral, which is the bit that actually does the business of catching the uh, flies. Let's have it once more slowly. Right. Right, there are the radii. Now it's, now it's doing the scaffolding, and now it's doing the real sticky spiral. What we're seeing there is not actually a picture of the web itself. That's a picture of the movements of a spider that were recorded on a particular day. That's a particular spider on a particular day. Its movements were all fed into the computer, and now the computer is playing it back to us. But that's just a recording of the web of a real particular spider. Now, in order to, to do our trick of making an arthromorph-like program out of spider webs, we've got to make the computer behave like a spider. And this is the program written by Peter Fuchs, who I'm glad to say is next door, uh, controlling the computer. And what his program does is to make the computer build a web as if it was a spider. So the computer is holding in its little head the rules that we know something about, 
of how a spider builds a web. So the computer does the radii like that. It does the spiral like that. Now, just as in the case of the arthromorphs, what Peter has done is to make the building rules of the computer spider under genetic control. There are genes in the computer, just as there were for the arthromorphs, and just as there were for the arthromorphs, the genes are simply numbers. That is the parent web. These are the daughter webs, more strictly. That's the web that was built by the parent spider. These are the webs that were built by the daughter spiders. Now, to begin with, we can treat this just as if it was an arthromorph program. So we want another volunteer. Let's have a girl this time. Right. Yes, please. What's your name? Ursula. Ursula. Come here, Ursula, please. Have you ever used a computer with a mouse? Yes. Yes, good. So this time it's just like the other one, only you have to click twice instead of once to choose which one you think is the best web. Okay, now that web has gone up to the, to the top there. That's now become the parent. And here are the daughter webs that are being drawn. And now you can make, choose another one, another generation. So you see, we're doing just the same as we did for the arthromorphs, but now we've got spider webs coming. But the point we were going to go for was not artificial selection. The whole point of doing this with spider webs is to do something like natural selection. And to do that, we simply make the computer work out how good each web would be at catching flies. And we can do that because unlike the case of the arthromorphs, the webs are two-dimensional structures, and we know what they're for. They're for catching flies. So the benefit is simply going to be the number of flies caught, and the cost we can calculate because the cost is the amount of silk used. Spider webs are made of silk. So the cost of a web is the amount of silk used, and the benefit is the, is the flies. Now, if you'd like to stop now, Ursula, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, we no longer have a human selector. We now have the flies doing the selecting. So the flies are going to hit the web when Peter gets it started up again. And right, so now we've got a new generation of webs being built. And we're now going to see the flies hitting the webs. There come the flies, flies again. Now the computer is going to calculate which of the webs is best at catching flies, and it's that one that's gone dark. So that one will now become the parent of the next generation. And now, once again, the webs are being built, the, ch the, the child webs are being built. Once again, the flies will come. The computer will measure which one of them is the best. There it is, and that becomes the parent of the next generation. Now, it wouldn't take very long for us to see the evolution starting from no web at all and going to a nice web that works very well. But we haven't quite got time for it. So um, instead, what we did was to let the computer run all night, all last night, and we've got a fossil record of all the webs that were built during that time. This was the starting web, the thing that started at the beginning of the night's run. And then every 20 generations, we have a printout of the shape of the web. So we see we start with almost no spiral at all, and you could imagine the flies just whizzing straight through and not getting caught. But then natural selection in the computer led to a gradual improvement in the web, more and more spiral, more and more flies caught, and so evolution went in the direction of a nice full web with a nice full spiral like that, catching lots of flies. That all went on in the computer last night, very fast, telescoping into one night what would have taken thousands of years, perhaps millions of years, in nature. In nature, the successful and the unsuccessful webs would not, of course, be judged by the computer doing a calculation about how many flies would have been caught, would be expected to be caught. They'd be judged automatically, the webs would be judged automatically 
and without any thought by the flies themselves. The flies themselves just fly into webs, thereby choosing webs for breeding. The flies don't know they're choosing the webs for breeding. They don't particularly want to fly into the webs. But nevertheless, the consequence of their inadvertently flying into webs is that the spider that built the successful web is a spider that's more likely to breed and therefore more likely to pass on the genes for building that sort of web. So as the generations go by, webs get better and better and better, just as they did in the computer in our overnight run. That's natural selection in the case but that's of... just artificial selection. We only began talking about artificial selection because we're really interested in natural selection. Natural selection is like artificial selection, except that instead of humans doing the choosing, nature does the choosing. Of all the puppies in a litter, or wolf cubs in a litter, instead of our choosing which ones shall breed, what happens is that nature chooses which ones shall breed. The ones that have what it takes to survive will be the ones that breed, automatically chosen. The ones that are good at running fast, the ones whose legs are not too short and not too long, the ones whose teeth are not too blunt and not too sharp, because if they're too sharp, they might break easily. Natural selection, nature, is constantly choosing which individuals shall live, which individuals shall breed. And the result, after many generations of natural selection, is much the same as the result after many generations of artificial There's selection. There's a branch of a tree. It seems to be moving. There goes its head. It's a bird. It flies off. A potu. Those are rose thorns. That's not a rose thorn. It's a bug. It gains protection by looking like a rose thorn. You could almost say that it's like a key that fits into the brain of a bird, and the bird mistakes it for a thorn. The bird has a rose thorn shaped lock. If that sounds a little bit mysterious, I hope I'll explain it in a moment, because I'm going to use the analogy of a lock and key. Whenever we see an apparently well-designed animal or plant, it's as if nature has the lock and the creature has the key. The thing about a lock and key is that the key has an intricate structure which is very hard to imitate and that structure exactly fits the lock. This key fits precisely into the lock and the holes in the key fit the teeth in the lock and the lock therefore opens. Just any old bit of bent wire won't do. It has to be the right key. The principle of the lock and key is that there's something intrinsically improbable in the shape of the key. You need that key to open the lock. In the case of an ordinary lock that you open with a key, it's not easy to measure how improbable the key is. But here's a combination lock, an ordinary bicycle lock. Here we know exactly how improbable it is, because there are three dials, and each one has six positions. That means there are six times six times six possibilities, which is 216. There's a one in 216 chance of opening it by luck. If the thorn bug is a key, what this means is that just any old shape won't do. It must be the exact shape of a rose thorn. A stick insect must be the exact shape of a stick. An upper tooth must fit, bite snugly against the lower teeth in your jaw. Yet the theory of evolution says that all these things evolved gradually, stage by stage. This means that they must have gone through intermediates when they were not a perfect key fitting a lock. The thorn bug must have been half like a thorn. The stick insect must have been half like a stick. But who ever heard of a key that only half fitted a lock. A key either fits a lock or it doesn't. So how do real living creatures manage to evolve their perfection? How do they manage to survive the intermediate stages? How do they work when they're only half a key? Well, let's approach the problem by going back to the combination lock. While I've been talking, Bryson's been discreetly doctoring his lock so that it behaves in a different way. If you could imagine a lock where instead of having to get all the dials in place at once, supposing I was trying to crack a safe and there was money in there, 
As it is, I can't do it because I've got to get all the dials in place at once. And I've only got a 1 in, in 216 chance of doing that. In a real bank safe, it would be 1 in billions. I can't do it. But suppose that I were able to try the first one at random and eventually find how to open that. And then the safe door peeps open a little bit and a little bit of money drops out. I've done that one. Now I can go on to the next one. And I find out where, how to open that one. I've only got a 1 in 6 chance. That's fine. And a little bit more money spills out. And now the final wheel, I've only got one in six chance, that's easy, and I open the entire safe. It's now become a gradualistic combination lock, whereas before it was an all or nothing combination lock. With this lock, the maximum number of tries that you need in order to open it by luck is not 216, but a mere 18. So it's easy to open a gradualistic combination key fitting a lock. It's not a totally good analogy, because in this case, half a key is better than no key. If nature is a combination lock, it's a gradualistic combination lock, not an all or nothing one. Now let's look at the same thing from another direction. It's been said that a monkey typing at random on a typewriter could eventually write the complete works of Shakespeare. We're going to have a computer monkey, or rather, we're going to have two computer monkeys, one called Hoyle and one called Darwin. Both monkeys have the same task. Both have to, to type not the complete works of Shakespeare, but one phrase from As You Like It, more giddy in my desires than a monkey. Hoyle types entirely at random. After every line that he types, the computer checks to see if he has managed to hit the target line. If he does, the computer will stop, bells will ring, it'll be the most improbable coincidence in the history of the world, and I solemnly promise to eat my hat. I'll go further than that. I bet you everything I possess that it won't reach the phrase. Let's shall we say in the next 10 billion years. I won't bet you I'll undertake to give everything I possess to the Royal Institution, and here's a legal document signed by me, which undertakes to make over everything I own to the Royal Institution in the event that the monkey Hoyle reaches the target phrase. But of course, this is just to illustrate my confidence that chance on its own could never make an I or a 747. The real point of the demonstration is that the other monkey, Darwin, will get the target phrase. So what does Darwin do? The same but with a crucial difference. The Darwin monkey begins by typing a random phrase. So far, it's the same as the Hoyle monkey. But now the computer breeds from that phrase. It breeds 50 offspring, which are identical to the first phrase, but with a tiny mutation, a tiny random difference in each of the 50 cases. The computer then looks at those 50 offspring and chooses the one which most resembles the target phrase, however slightly it resembles the target phrase. So the generations go by, and after generation after generation, it gradually becomes more and more like the target phrase. Now, when I uh, agreed to give these lectures, I was told that I should always call members of the audience out to assist, but I was also told that it was silly to do this if all I was going to ask them to do was to come out and hit the return button on a computer. However, on this particular occasion, since so much is at stake, I thought it would be better if I did ask somebody who knows a lot about computers and is very good at pressing buttons to come out and perform this onerous task. So, would anybody like to volunteer to... Yes, right in there. Now, you are... what's your name? Andrew. Well, you understand what's at stake, at stake, Andrew, do you? Okay. Here's the target phrase, more giddy in my desires than a monkey. There's the box where the Hoyle monkey is going to type, and there's the box where the Darwin monkey is going to type. And unless Bryson's been messing around with the program in order to deprive me of my worldly goods, that's the way it's going to be. So, are you ready? Go. Now, you see the Hoyle monkey typing away entirely at random. The Darwin monkey is down here. And I think we can begin to see something appearing in the Darwin row. More if giddy in my desires than do... 
bang, and it's got there. How long did that take? Anybody time it? Not very long, I think. Anyway, thank you very much. So I don't have to eat my hat, and my worldly goods, such as they are, are safe. But the point really is not that Hoyle failed to reach the target. The point is that Darwin did reach the target, and astonishingly quickly. Well, there's a lot wrong with that as a demonstration of Darwinian natural selection. For one thing, it has a distant target in mind, which natural selection does not have. But it does once again show us the key to the way out of the problem of mammoth improbability. This is a mountain. It's called Mount Improbable. Sitting on the top of the mountain is equivalent to being very well designed, to being an eye that works very well, for example. Being at the bottom of the mountain is equivalent to being a distant ancestor that is not yet very well designed, that hasn't yet acquired its good fitness to the environment. Looking, facing you now, is a precipice, a cliff, which is called sheer luck. It's a sheer cliff. Jumping from the bottom of the cliff to the top corresponds to assembling a 747 by means of a hurricane or it corresponds to getting a complete eye in a single lucky mutation. It can't be done. You can no more do that than a mountaineer could leap from the bottom of a, of a cliff to the top. But this isn't the only route up Mount Improbable. We have to go round the other side. And you'll notice that round here is a gradual sloping path, steadily inching its way up the mountain. And if you follow it round, you'll find that even though some bits of it are a little bit steep, you can get from the bottom to the top without ever having to jump up a step. It's a gradual inch by inch path up. Anybody who didn't know about the ramp evolution, which is what that's called, would, if they saw an animal perched on the top, a beautifully designed animal, and only saw the cliff, they would assume that it had to be the result of a miracle. But in fact, the only way up Mount Improbable is the slow, gradual climb up the ramp evolution. You have to add all the little steps up together, and after a very large number of steps, you can climb very, very high indeed. But we're still talking in parables. How in practice do living things climb Mount Improbable? Well, of course, individuals don't climb it. It's lineages, groups of animals, species that climb it, and they do it in evolutionary time. They and their descendants and their descendants' descendants. They do it by going through an extremely large number of generations. And we do have the time for an extremely large number of generations because we have geological time at our disposal. Now I want to apply this lesson to three particular cases, three particular problems that have given difficulty. The eye, the wing, and camouflage. And I choose them because they are famously regarded as difficult. First, the eye. Charles Darwin himself said, to this day, the eye makes me shudder. Creationists are particularly fond of the eye because they like saying, what is the use of half an eye? An eye only works, they say, if every little detail is in place. Until you've got that, the eye won't see anything at all, so how could it possibly have evolved? And even serious scientists have sometimes queried whether there's been enough time for the evolution of the eye. Well, suppose we start with an ancestor who didn't really have an eye at all, but just a single, simple sheet of light-sensitive cells. That's represented by this screen here, and there's a television camera behind looking at the screen so that we on the screen, on the television screen, shall see what this primitive animal would see. So this animal, with hardly any eye at all, will at least be able to tell the difference between light and dark. Light and dark. Now, the next stage in evolution would be to have a shallow cup. This animal would be able to tell the direction that light 
is coming from because there a shadow would appear a shadow would appear there and if you can tell the direction a light is coming from then you can tell the direction that a predator is coming from now although we've represented this as a cup coming out from the wall it would in fact probably be an indentation and it would be a gradual indentation it's inconvenient to make a gradual indentation. It has to be made as a rather abrupt cup that comes out six inches at a time. But it's easy to see that that shadow effect that we've just been witnessing would work progressively and gradually as the cup gets bigger. Let's make it bigger still now, Bryson. And this cup is even more effective. And if we go on to the next stage where we make the cup gradually bigger again, so big that it becomes just a little hole in the end. Right now, this animal has a very good idea of exactly where the light is, and by the same token, exactly where, for example, a predator is. And I think with this eye, we might even get a little image. See if we can get an image of Bryson's hand. That smudge there is Bryson's hand and you can just about see a very dim image of his fingers. So an animal with an eye like this would be able to see perhaps just a little bit what kind of predator it was. Let's go to the logical conclusion which would be a pinhole. Remember this is all gradual gradual change in evolution. Right, let's see if we can see your hand again Bryson. Now I can see a rather precise picture of Bryson's hand. It's not a very bright one but I can see every finger clearly delimited. So I could see, if I were this animal, I could see my predator in some detail. There is an animal that has a pinhole camera for an eye. It's a mollusk called Nautilus. Now, a pinhole camera is not a very good way of seeing. It does produce a sharp image, but because it's so narrow, you hardly get any light in. The answer to this problem is that ingenious device, the lens. How might the lens have evolved? Well, let's imagine that it started with just a single transparent sheet of some transparent material. And all that this was doing, it's not a lens yet, all that it's doing is protecting the eye. In Nautilus, seawater flows right inside the eye. This animal now has some protection. And the eye is really just the same as, as though there wasn't any transparent material there. Now, we're going to use an uh, optician set of lenses here. It would be nice to be able to have just one bit of transparent material which we would then squeeze and make thicker. But we can't do that, so we're going to replicate that effect by a whole series of little lenses. So this is the next stage in evolution. This animal here, let's get a, an image of that. Okay, that's a rather better and above all brighter image of the hand. Let's have the next lens in. Right, now, if an animal that had an eye like that would have a really very, very clear view of its world, it could tell exactly uh, what its predator was. So we have a gradual pathway all the way up Mount Improbable from no eye to an eye. Half an eye is better than no eye. Half an eye is better than 49% of an eye. 1% of an eye is better than no eye at all. And far from there not being enough time for the evolution of the eye, the evolution of the eye is so quick and easy that it must have happened many, many times over. Eyes can evolve at the drop of a hat. And in fact, if we look around the animal kingdom, there are lots of different kinds of eyes dotted around. And each of them is different. Many of them work on completely different principles, and they have evolved quite independently of each other, many times over. Not entirely surprisingly, creationists are also very fond of wings. And they uh, once again make a similar point about what's the good of half a wing, what's the good of three quarters of a wing. How could something like those wings have evolved from the silly little wing stubs that must have been there at the beginning of the evolution of wings? Well, let's tackle this with another little Bryson special. These are 
not exactly flying creatures. They live up trees and they have wings to show they're creatures. They also have little eyes to show that they're creatures. Uh, they live up trees and if they were to fall from the trees, they would uh, have been at, in, at risk of breaking their necks. Thank you. Both of them, in this case, uh, from this low height, one with a little skirt and without a little skirt, uh, survive the, the, the breakage. At this depth, you don't need a little wing. This is a wing stub, call it a flange or a wing stub. It's not become a wing, but we're looking at the ancestral uh, stub that might eventually have evolved into a wing. When the height is sufficiently low, then nobody's going to break their neck. But if we raise the thing a bit, very carefully, Sometimes these animals are going to find themselves leaping from higher branches. And at, from higher branches, it may be that these little, even pathetic little wing stubs like this might make a difference. Let's see what happens now. Right. Now, in this case, from that higher level... From that higher level, even a little wing stub like this can make a difference. And once you've got the evolution of a wing stub this long, then natural selection may favour the, the wing stub getting a bit longer still, because there's going to be an even higher height that you could fall from, where the difference between a wing stub that high and between a wing stub that high might make a difference. And the point is that we have a smooth gradient all the way up higher and higher heights that you could fall from, to drive the lineage, to drive the species towards ever longer wings. Controlled gliding has in fact evolved many times over. There are many creatures that have the equivalent of half a wing. This is a snake, a tree snake, crawling along a tree. So far it looks like an ordinary snake. But now it launches itself off, a slow motion picture, the body flattens out sideways and catches the air. It's steering itself down and it's going to land on another tree without hurting itself. This you can think of as the first step towards evolving wings. Snakes never have evolved wings, but that's one possible pathway towards evolving wings. Now here's a squirrel, a tree squirrel, so-called flying squirrel, it has flaps of skin between its arms and its legs, and it glides with them. This is a very beautifully controlled glide. It's downhill all the way. It doesn't go, doesn't flap, it doesn't climb. But it lands gracefully on a neighboring tree. And is completely unhurt when it does so. This is an animal, again, with something like 50% of a wing. And the third example is a lizard. In this case, it has skin stretched between its ribs. All these are different ways in which wings might have evolved. In no case did they properly evolve, but they show what the beginnings of wings might have looked like. So not only can you do well if you have half a wing or a quarter of a wing, but lots of animals actually do. This is a flying lemur. Looks like the flying squirrel we just saw, but it's totally unrelated. It comes from Southeast Asia, has nothing to do with it. And I think you can easily imagine how that could eventually give rise to something like that, a flying fox, which is a bat. That has proper wings, that's as good as a hawk. Uh, that can fly and flap properly. Here we have a woodland floor, which has 16 insects on it. And from where you're sitting, you can probably see some of them. And that's really the point. The seeing conditions from a distance are such that you can only see some of them. Similarly, if I look out of the corner of my eye, I can now see one or two of them, but not all of them. There are, I'm going to narrow it down, narrow down the discussion to just distance, and I'd like to call for a volunteer to help me with this. Right, thank you. What's your name? Annie. Annie. Come here, Annie, please. Now, where's the pointer? Thank you. Stand here. Now, tell me, can you, how many insects can you see? Just point, point to one. We like to take the, the pointer and point to it. Which, which ones can you see? Can you see any? 
Yeah. There? What do you think that is? Butterfly. That's a yellow butterfly, right. Can you all, probably most of you can see that yellow butterfly. Mm -hmm. And from this distance, I guess you can probably see a blue beetle, a blue beetle, green beetle, perhaps that red one there. So if you're a bird from that distance, you can see quite a lot. But now come a bit closer, Annie. Can you see any more that you couldn't see before? What can you see? Point. A black beetle. And a green one there. Yes. And there, there's a cockroach. I can see a cockroach there. Now, a bird from this distance could spot the cockroach, whereas a bird from that distance could spot the yellow butterfly. Now let's come in really close. Now, can you see anything more? From a bird this distance might have a chance of seeing. What about that? What do you think that is? Come away from the stand aside. Uh, there, look at that. That's a leaf butterfly. And what about, look Annie, look at this. What's that? There. It's a leaf insect. There's its head. There's its body. There's a stick insect. There. Good. Thank you very much, Annie. Earlier this year, I was driving through the countryside with a little girl of six, and she pointed out some flowers by the wayside. I asked her what she thought flowers were for. She gave a very thoughtful answer. Two things, she said. To make the world pretty and to help the bees make honey for us. Well, I thought that was a very nice answer, and I was very sorry I had to tell her that it wasn't true. Her answer is not too different from the answer that most people throughout history would have given. The very first chapter of the Bible sets it out. Man has dominion over all living things. The animals and plants are there for our benefit. This attitude was unquestioned throughout the Middle Ages, and it really persists to this day. One pious man in the Middle Ages thought that weeds were there to benefit us, because it's so good for our spirit to have to go and pull them up. And another reverend gentleman thought that the louse 